Welcome to Randall Walker of Sadist Stock Dogs. I'm so glad you could join us, Randall. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Um, Randall, you are a dog trainer and a rancher, and I wonder if, and you're out of Toppenish, Washington, I wonder if you could just give us like a rundown on your operation a little bit, what your history is with ranching and with cow dogs. Uh, so third generation rancher. Um, we were primarily a cow, 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 calf operation and, uh, we've switched gears a bit, um, more yearlings. Um, we, we dabble in some bucking cows, uh, when, when cows are real high, uh, six years ago, we, instead of buying more cows, like a lot of guys did, we sold out and then the price dropped and so now instead of uh instead of buying back in we we seasonally run cattle because uh we'll, we'll buy broken mouth cows um put them through the winter calve them out and then come summer sell the whole outfit we don't have to run bulls and we have a lot more grass that way yeah describe a little bit the landscape uh the moisture you get what what your range is like that you run cows on and that you use your dogs with the moisture we get our average rainfall is eight inches a year um our our irrigation depends on our snowpack in the mountains which is always I don't want to say always better knock on some wood, but most generally is really good. So we have irrigated ground. Um, the dry ground is a little harder to run on. Uh, hold on just a sec. The dry ground's a little harder to run on. Um, it's, it's good feed until it gets hot here and then the feed dries up and there's really nothing there and and that depends it also depends on the rain we get in the spring whether or not uh we have enough feed okay and what's a what's a typical pasture size what's a typical plot of land that you have cattle on um we we actually run this is where the dogs come in we actually run on a lot of little ma and pop pieces uh 15 20 acres they just wanted eight off and a lot of them pieces you can get, you just have to fix the fence, but there's no real corral system. So without the dogs um, utilizing them type of pastures wouldn't be possible. Yeah, simply because you're moving cattle around a lot and you're loading them without handling equipment. And so you're, I, I've watched some of your videos on YouTube. I mean, you're just parking a trailer out there and using your dogs well, to load things up. Yeah. You know, like the, the one pasture we got, you know, uh, they wanted to know why we didn't bring panels in, why we didn't do this. Well, they had just recently paved that driveway and they're like, under no circumstances, do anything to this driveway. <laughs> so, and, and I caught a lot of grief about it because I had my dad standing there and they're like, well, if that guy would move, they'd go in there easy. Well, yeah, they would, but they'd also get on the driveway, which the people didn't want. And I didn't feel like paying for. So, um, we just had to improvise. But that's how we load a lot of them cattle. You just back up to a gate, or if we can pull out in there and use the fence line, that's what we do, and that's how we load them. Fascinating. And all border collies in your operation? All border collies. You know, uh, 20 years ago, I had every breed of dog imaginable that would bite a cow. And border collies, are this, this specific line of border collies, um by far outdid all them other dogs and i mean we, we've had cur dogs hanging trees uh, a few kelpies crossbred dogs idaho shags i mean anything that would bite a cow i would try and then luckily i found this line of dogs and um we've been with this specific line of dogs about 15 years okay how many dogs do you suppose you've had over the years Oh, how many dogs or how many good ones? <laughs> uh, which would you rather talk about? Um, the good ones, because, you know, everybody says, oh, you, you get one good dog and one good horse in your lifetime. Well, I, I must be extremely lucky because I've had several good dogs. 
Um, it, it all really started with that Zorro dog. Uh, he's kind of the foundation of our program. Um, and until Zorro, I didn't even know they made a border collie like that. <laughs> does, you know, does, and then, sorry, does Zorro, does Zorro stand out in your mind then as your favorite, or are you willing to say who's your favorite farm dog in the past? Your favorite, uh, herding dog? Um, and that's like saying, which one of your kids do you like the best? You know, that's kind of tough. <laughs> right. Um, how, about a, how about a favorite memory of like, do you have a, a situation that stands out in your mind of like, this just seemed like an impossible task and your dog just showed up that day and, and lived up to it and, uh, did a wonderful yeah, job. Here, here's a good one. We was up, uh, we was up North catching some cattle and uh they were they were hereford cattle and they uh they were pretty wild and this was when zorro really started to shine and so what we would do we had cur dogs then and and we would bay them up now cur dogs don't work like a like a border collie they're not going to bring the cattle to you they they circle them and, and they hold them up and i'd so we'd bay a set up and then i'd pull them cur dogs and I could go in with the border collies and, and move them cattle around. Um, you had to stay way off them. And even then, once in a while, you'd have a cow break. Well, this cow had broken. I mean, we're right on the ocean, and this this old cow, she gets right to the water, and Zorro just and Zorro catches her. And I roped her and Zorro going out into the ocean. I had to throw, I had to throw a lot of rope cause I had to rope over Zorro and then sink it back in. <laughs> That's amazing. That's... Yeah. So that, well, I mean, and then that, that same trip, like I said, we were baying them cows up with them curs and I'd bay to set up and I was going back to get them. And, uh, I had Zorro, Nelly and cricket. And I watched Zorro wind and he took off the wrong way. And I'm like, well, you some, that's completely the wrong way. And I went and picked them cows up and I was headed back to the trap and I, I could hear trees breaking and cows bellering. Well, Zorro had went and found his own cows and brought them and put them in with the cows I, I had. And we were going a little faster than I liked because it was real brushy there. And like I said, you had to stay way off them cows. If their head picked up, you were too close. And I mean, it, uh from that day on um it was all border collars for me <laughs> that was the day huh that's when it that was the day <laughs> that's great you know i don't often think of um western cattle ranches in the ocean together you know maybe that that was definitely a new one for me too yeah <laughs> yeah we're, we're we're quite a ways from we're three four hours from the ocean and i mean we never never go over there i mean i've been to hawaii four or five times and i've never been to the beach so um the ocean really isn't my thing but when uh when that cow was going i mean she was just she went to, she was going to the ocean she was swimming for it and i knew that if i didn't rope her she was just gonna be gone mm, right huh amazing well um on that note, tell me what a cow dog is. You know, I, I mean, cow dog doesn't necessarily have to be crossed with a Labrador retriever to retrieve cattle out in the ocean. But um, how is a cow dog different from another herding dog? I know on your website, you there's that's a point of emphasis that you're you're raising border collies, but specifically you're breeding and raising and training cow dogs. Well, I, I caught a lot of grief on that too because, uh, you know, in my opinion a cow dog can handle any any level of cattle but whether it be wild cattle uh horn cattle um now a stock dog will handle cattle that want to be handled so if they feel like going with the flow that dog can handle that situation if they don't want to do it that dog isn't strong enough to make them do it where a cow dog is i see and what sort of traits do you when you say, okay, that dog is now, has now become a cow dog, what sort of traits do you see? What are the things that you need? You know, it's nothing that they acquire. It's they're, they're either born with it or they're not. Um, we, we start looking 
as early as seven weeks old. We take them pups and put them on, on some sheep. And what we're looking for mainly is fear, because if they have any fear, it's going to show back up later on in training. And, and what all people fail to realize is fear overcomes all training. So if that dog's afraid, it, it's, it's going to show up. And usually at the most inopportune time. Mm -hmm. So how do you identify, how do you recognize fear? What's, what are typical reactions of a pup that just doesn't make the grade because of that? Um, when they face up with the stock or the stock comes forward, if, if they move away, it's, it's usually out of fear. Now, then the, the stronger pups, when that stock comes to them, they, they go to them, you know, it's I the see. complete opposite. Right. Oh, interesting. So can a, can a dog, well, let me ask you this, uh, of the litters you produce, what percentage do you say would you say have that that cow dog potential right away at like seven eight weeks and and what what percentage of your litters do you just need to set aside and say those need to go to a different home those aren't going to be cow dogs you know um there there's so much variance in litters to, to i mean you, you can have one litter and you'll have you know if you have six pups five of them would be real good and you could have another litter of six pups and two would be good. And then you might have another litter of six pups and none of them will be cow dogs. There, there's, you know, um, as far as breeding goes, breeding for a cow dog is the hardest thing there is to do. It's harder than, than breeding cattle. I mean, cattle, you're, you're wanting gain and marbling, you know, same with sheep and, and goats. That, that's not that hard to do. Um, if you want to breed for color, also not that hard to do. But when you're breeding for eight or 10 traits and you only get two out of every cross, and, and here's the kicker, you don't get to pick the two traits that you get. So that makes it pretty tough. Yeah, absolutely. And really, if you want to make quick progress through a breeding program it's you, you can't be breeding for too many things right so wh where does your breeding philosophy lie like what are the main if you could just pick the top three variables you're trying to control what what do you want to see in your breeding program um you, you have to have them dogs fairly broke and you have to be real honest about it and and know what their strengths and what their weaknesses are and then when you cross that dog, whether it be the male or the female, you never breed two dogs that have the same weakness because that's that's going to intensify that weakness. Or the, more than likely, then pups will end up being weaker than their parents in that same area. Um, and then I, I like I breed them dogs fairly tight. Um, you know to get. To get traits homeless agus, you need to be between 30 and 40 percent coefficient. And anytime you outcross, you're, you're more than likely covering up problems rather than bringing in new good traits. You know, so say if you have fertility issues, for for instance, um, the, the fertility issues are still there. By outcrossing, all you're doing is covering it up. The problem is still there. And every dog has a weakness or two, right? So even your best, um, Zorro, was that your foundation dog? Like what, yeah. what, what was Zorro's weakness and how do you decide, you know, a weakness in this area we can live with, we can improve upon that with some, with the right crosses, but this, we just can't tolerate. So that's, that's not going to be a dog that we breed in the future. Um, you know, the beauty of breeding dogs is just like you said, everyone has weaknesses. There is no perfect dog. So it's an unobtainable goal. So it's, <laughs> you know, it's actually pretty fun. Um, a weakness that we, we can't, that will take you out of the breeding program is fear. Mm. Um, and, and, and the other thing that will take you out of the breeding program, you might not be the toughest dog, but if you have that no quit attitude, that's something to really build upon. 
And if you don't have that attitude, I really, you know, you could have a real tough dog that goes in there and, and has a little war. And then he's like, well, I'm done where you have a dog that's not quite as tough, but he, you know, he's not just there to win the war. He's there to win the battle. Right. So that's, that's something I really look at. And I would imagine that that no quit attitude has like, that's important in two different ways. Uh, tell me if I'm wrong, but it's important in the field when you're actually doing the work, but it's also important in training, right? You need that kind of, that dog that doesn't get bored and can and just keep going in the, in your training sessions too, right? Yeah. You know, all training is, is habits created through repetition and it, it can get boring. Um, the, the beauty of the border collie is they are also a workaholic. So they, they never really get bored with it. And, and that's something else I'm looking for. I'm looking for that, not only physical toughness, but that mental toughness. Mm -hmm. When you see a, a trait in a puppy or even an older dog that is kind of a disqualifying trait um, and it's just not going to work on your ranch, can that dog still make a good herding dog for people who have uh, – you know, easier cattle to work with or sheep or goats, or is that trait probably going to disqualify it from work in general? Oh, no, no, no. Um, a lot of the dogs that don't make it here go other places and, and they make great dogs for them people, but they're not necessarily looking for what I'm looking for. Uh, I'm looking, you know, 20 years ago, I mean, some of these dogs that aren't, aren't making the cut here would have been great, but now, um, we're looking for the elite of the elite and just because they don't make it here doesn't mean that they won't be a good useful dog on a ranch somewhere else. Mm -hmm. You also trial your dogs. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and, and so that's where like the, you, the standard of excellent just has to be, you know, one notch or a couple notches above even what a working dog on a ranch would be, or is it just two different games entirely? Uh, it's pretty much two different games entirely. I mean, you know, we, we've done really well at trialing. Um, we, we've won quite a bit, but when, whenever I make a cross, it, it never crosses my mind. Oh, this would be a great trial dog. That has <laughs> nothing to do with how I breed my dogs or what I breed for. Um, I, I'm breeding strictly for cow dogs. Now we run, we run quite a few sheep. We ventured into, uh, registered dorper sheep and we had a bit we had a fairly large uh commercial flock before we went to the registered sheep and i mean i work i use them same cow dogs on them sheep uh but r ranch work and and you know cowboy and type dogs feedlot dogs sales yard dogs stuff like that that that's the type of dog that we breed for um trialing is just something we do on the weekend okay yeah that helps and do you do you train only your dogs or do you take in client dogs as well uh we take we do take in client dogs um we, we have several client dogs here right now in fact we got some we're getting ready for the mountain states national finals um and then we, we have some here that'll just be, you know, ranch dogs. So okay. we, we do train both. Now here's the kicker. I don't change anything in how I train for the ranch or the trial. You know, a lot of people will say, Oh, a ranch dog. You know, I, I need a, I need a ranch dog, not a trial dog. Well, there's no difference. All you're, all we're doing is we're teaching them dogs to apply pressure and take it off. A dog learns, a dog learns from the release of pressure, not from the application. Same with cattle, horses, anything. So when we're moving them cattle, it's not the application of pressure that the dog puts to the cow. It's the release. Yeah. Explain that to me a little more. Like uh, when, when your dogs are working the cattle, uh, what's, what are the mannerisms of the of the cattle that tell you the dog needs to apply more pressure and then how how do you or the dog know to release that pressure and how is that done? Um, so the, on cattle, uh, you know, cattle and sheep have different flight zones. Um, 
obviously two different size animals. But on cattle, when a dog presents himself, he, he needs to present himself in a way that, you know, telling that cow she needs to move off. Now, where a lot of people, in my opinion, mess up is instead of letting that cow make all the decisions, they try to make all the decisions for that cow. And what I mean by that is when that dog presents itself, that, that cow is going to do one of three things. She's going to move right off. She's going to come towards the dog and some cows are going to attack the dog. Now, in any of them three instances, that dog can show no fear and needs to hold his ground. If that dog will do that, and if that cow does come, and, and this is why I say a cow dog has to use his teeth, has to bite, is he has to be able to defend himself. So when that cow comes, he needs to make sure that that cow realizes that that was not a great decision. Now, the beauty of that is every decision that has been made was that cow's. We didn't try to force her to do anything. She, she made all the decisions and she probably learned from it. Um, if, if them dogs just fly in there and go to biting on them cows, them cows never really got to a chance to make any decision. They just had to react. So now they're reactive instead of responsive. Gotcha. Yeah, that helps that the analogy of, you know, letting the cow make its own decision, but making it clear that this is a bad decision and that's a good one <laughs> that right. I think that that's helpful. Yeah. You know, when, we, when I watch some of your videos and I have zero experience with um, working cattle with herding dogs, but there is, I think at first blush, it's easy to say, well, this is just dogs running around and biting at the ankles of, of those cows. But if you watch closer, there is much more of that pressure release, pressure release, let the cow make a good decision thing. You just have to kind of let filter through the barking and the scramble and the dust that's, you know, and then you realize yeah. there is a, there is a, like, there's a dance going on here. Very much. And you know, when that, when that cow gives the pressure then and moves off, then that dog needs to take it off of her. If that dog continues on that cow's like, well, I moved off. What do you want? You're still applying pressure to me. So there was no release. Right, so they're not left with the reward of making this decision, the good, because the pressure keeps coming. Exactly. Yeah. And do you, um, do the dogs have that kind of built in, the, the ability to apply pressure and then release it, or is that something that comes through commands, or is it something we, that's a little bit of both? We call that rate, and rate is one part genetic and one part training. Okay. So there is a command to back off the pressure, but you need a dog that. Uh... Um, not, not so much a command. Okay. Um, because if that dog, if we, if I send that dog over the, over a hill and I'm not there to tell him how fast to go, I mean, he's going to bring them cows just as fast as he wants. And I don't want them cows going fast because we're in the, we're in the business of putting weight on them. So why, why waste all them profits because the dog's going too fast. So when that dog has them cows moving at a nice steady pace and they're not stressed, that dog needs to read that for himself and to obtain that in training when, when he's doing correctly, I leave him alone. If he's going too fast, I correct him. But that way he, he figures it just like them cows, that dog starts to figure it out for themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. Um, so that just takes, you know, the genetics need to be there, but that takes just a lot of repetition and a lot of being in the situation, right? In order for them to understand that, that dog. Well, it, if you're dealing with, with a well-bred dog, it should be bred in there. Um, so you, you have to mold it a little bit, but, um, you know, I, I've learned more about working stock from dogs than I ever did on my own, by just, you know, by watching them dogs, they read stock, um, better than most people. Um, 
actually they read stock better than a lot of people, but <laughs> you, you know, you, you have to, us as humans, it seems we're always in a hurry, no matter what we're doing, we're in a hurry. And, um, with, with dogs and stock slow is fast. One, one of the coolest things in, that I saw in your videos, and I've seen this in some other herding dog videos too, is um, you're on horseback and you're up on a hill and you just send the dogs off to cattle that you can't see in the, the camera frame and you wait. And uh, pretty soon, you know, after a little while, the dogs start bringing them back. I mean, that is, for a guy like me, he lives on, in the Midwest and uh, we don't have that, you know, big expanses of land to work with. That is really amazing to see, but that's got to, that's got to require a lot of trust in your dogs. Like how, how long, how old of, does a dog need to be and, and how much trust do you have to have in that dog before you just send them off into a situation where you can't correct them if, if, because even if you suspect they're doing something wrong, you can't correct them from long range because, they, they might be doing something right and you can't quite tell. And then you've just corrected them on doing something right. Um, you know, we, we like to start our dogs between 10 and 12 months of age. We feel by that age, they are physically and mentally mature enough for training. Now, once we have about 90 days on that dog, um, and, and, and this is just in general because it varies with every dog, but once we have about 90 days on them dogs, they're usually pretty solid. You know, they, they understand moving stock. And once that dog understands moving stock, you can get a lot of jobs done with very little commands because they understand what they're doing. Now, increasing distance on a dog, that, that takes a little time. Um, we, we actually set it up here uh, where we'll, we'll put some cattle in, in the back pasture where there's a lot of trees and a lot of brush where the dog cannot see the cattle. Um, and, and we'll, we'll put, we'll place some cattle in a general area. Now, you know, they are cattle, so they're most likely going to move. But, uh, when we send that dog, we know that that them cattle are there for sure. So, um, in the beginning, we, you know, we want to make sure that we never lie to that dog. We don't want to send them somewhere where there is no cattle. Right. And, and, and once, once they start to figure that out, you know, we'll increase the distance. And, and it's funny because the first couple of times you do it, you put them cattle in the same place. And then, and then the third time you move them cattle and that dog, this is how smart they are. They will run right to that spot where them cattle have been the two previous times and and then they're like okay i know there's some here i gotta find them and then uh you know you just you let them bring them and um some sometimes the first couple times they'll be a little excited they're going to bring them a little faster than i would like but it you know it's it's a learning fa phase for them and they just have to go through it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is is it possible to have too much of a cow dog to make the transition or to be a good sheep and goat working dog? Like, or can they make that transition back and forth uh, between the animals really easily? Like if I've trained to a, if I've got the genetics and the training into a cow dog, is that also going to make a great sheep and goat dog? Um, I've never, I haven't found one yet. I'm, I'm still looking though. <laughs> you haven't found one that's too much of a cow dog for your sheep? No. Okay. No, I haven't, I haven't found one yet. Um, you know, most of the time, if, if they're too rough on sheep, it's, it's because the dog isn't, isn't broke or they've been prevented from doing what they want to do for so long that, uh, they, even though, even though they know they're going to get in trouble, they're willing to do it to get what they want. We, we take a little different approach to our training. Um, a lot of guys, you know, never let them dogs bite, you know, using their teeth is, is no good. Um, I found by letting that dog bite and then stopping him, 
now that dog, he's got what he wanted. He wanted to bite. And then uh, by stopping him, we've released the pressure. And by doing that, I found that pretty soon that bite, it, it no longer becomes such a big deal to them. They, can, they know that they can do it if they need to, and it's not a big deal. Huh, interesting. That, I can see how that would work. Yeah, it's kind of like telling a, don't tell a teenager not to do something. That's exactly what they'll do, you know. But what... it, exactly. And, and we can try to prevent them from it all we want, but sooner or later, they're, they're going to do it. Right. Right. Now, the the topic of um, I has been brought up on our podcast a couple of times. Um, just kind of keeping in mind, we probably have listeners who aren't familiar with strong-eyed versus loose-eyed. Um, the Border Collie's typically a strong-eyed dog, meaning one that uses a, a stare and crouch and body posture to intimidate. But you've mentioned several times, too, that you need a bite on your dogs. Um how important is I to you in working cattle and um, is it more important with cattle than sheep or vice versa? Uh, I'd say I is more important on sheep than it is cattle. Um, I, I do like a dog with some eye to it. A loose eyed dog doesn't bother me, especially uh, for a big range dog. Uh, it seems a loose side dog on range cattle, he never misses any, you know, he's always looking around and paying attention to where them strong eyed dogs might get focused on, on a certain uh, group of cows and they might miss something where a loose side dog won't. Um, now some will say, you know, if, if that dog's out wide enough, he's going to get all the stock. Well, I, I agree with that to an extent. I mean, when, when you're in 10 sections, it's pretty hard for that dog to cover all, all 10 sections. I mean, a section 640 acres. So that's a, that's a lot of country for him to cover. Hmm. And, but and sheep, sheep tend to flock together way better than cattle. Okay. And so you, the, the loose, the strong eyed dog kind of has that laser focus. Maybe the first group of cattle it comes across, whereas a, a loose eyed dog is just going to has a broader view of the landscape, perhaps. In a sense. Yes. Um, okay. you know, and a loose eyed dog will never be as stylish as, as a dog with a lot of eye. Mm -hmm. you, most, most generally they're more of an upright working dog. And is the stylishness, is that important to the trialing world? Um, to the sheepdog world, I believe. Uh, to the cow dog world, uh, it's a little different because in the cow dog world, there's nothing judged. It's all time and points. So it, it depends on what you get done. I see. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It's what you get done. Okay. Okay. Um, just rewinding a little bit so the you said the strong-eyed dog is probably a little more important on the sheep because the sheep will be grouped together already so you don't need that kind of that ranginess you you need that focus on the sheep um is, is, am i interpreting that correctly yeah you know um sheep sheep won't be as spread out as as cattle will um they, they stay a little tighter together um, and, and as that, as that dog comes around, you know, they band up, um, where cows, especially Coriannis, uh, when that dog goes around there and that, that cow's like, well, you know, that dog's got those ones, let's run this way. Sheep, sheep really don't run off on their, on their own unless they've had enough pressure put on them to do so. Mm-hmm. Where, okay. ca where cows are more than willing to run off on their own. Mm -hmm. And is the the position and body posture of a strong-eyed dog usually enough to move sheep on its own? How often do you call on your dogs to bite um, to keep the sheep going where you need them? Um, a, a dog very rarely 
needs to bite a sheep. Now, I'm not saying that it, it they don't ever need bit because some of them will use, uh, you know, they'll they'll challenge that dog, especially the rams, uh, or use with babies. Uh, they they will challenge a dog, and if if they come forward and that dog moves off, they've just taught that that animal how to intimidate that dog. You know, if they come forward, that dog needs to bite that animal and show them that that was the wrong decision. Right. Okay. And while we're on the topic of sheep, um, I did watch a couple of videos that you have sheep in, and I see some guardian dogs kind of wandering in and around the, that flock. Uh, what kind of livestock guardian dogs do you have? Uh, they, are, they are a Turkish Boz, Kongal, and Akbosh Cross. Okay. I just did another podcast recently where we did talk about the the Boz Congo. The, is the Boz and the Congo typically paired together as a crossing, or are they two distinct breeds? They are two distinct breeds. Okay. And are you happy with that mix? Very much. Um, I, I like I like the Akbosh in there because they're more herd orientated. You know, they stay with their sheep more. The Congo and the Boz are pretty rangy. So, you know, they're, they're out, they're out checking perimeters and, and, uh, they'll be around them sheep, but they're not right there with them sheep where the Akbosh are always right there with them. Yeah. Okay. So, and what kind of predators are you dealing with there, uh, that you, your dogs are necessary? Uh, we, we have quite a few coyotes, uh, bears, cougars bobcats and and now we have wolves <laughs> so you've got it all yeah what's the and and we have two-legged predators as well uh-huh sometimes the worst probably most likely the worst yeah yeah um what uh what ratio do you like to run your stock your uh, livestock guardian dogs at like uh, how, how many do you need in that particular flock uh, you know, when we were running 700 ewes, um, we had five dogs. Um, I've still got four, but I, I really probably only need two. But these these four are the ones that I like, so I kept them. <laughs> and um, so you you keep the, all 700 together as a flock or however many you have now. You're basically running one group at a time, not several in multiple places. Yeah. Um, when, when we were at, when we had 700, we were running three, di three different groups. Uh, but now I, I'm down to just a hundred head of sheep. So, uh, right now it's, you know, two groups, we got the lambs and which the replacement use and the Ram lambs, uh, and then the, the use with the Rams. Do you, free graze your sheep uh, you know over a large area or do you try to keep them in smaller paddocks and rotate them kind of mob graze them yeah right now they're on a they're on rotational grazing okay um we we, we haven't been free we haven't been free ranging them on that dry feed just because uh i found on this irrigated feed they you know the gain is so much more I see. Am I correct in thinking that as you do that rotational grazing and reduce the size of the paddock, that your your dogs just aren't as spread as thin because that, that fewer dogs can give you the protection you need because they're not covering a large area. Yeah, you know, like I said, like right now, I mean, I I could do everything I need to do with two dogs because one dog would stay with the sh with the sheep while the other dog checked the perimeter. Okay. All right. And do you breed your uh, livestock guardian dogs too and provide your own from your own litters or do you go out looking for replacements when you need them? No. Um, I, for the last two years now, I, I've bred all my own. Um, I, I brought dogs in from Montana and Texas and uh, I, I'm really happy with the dogs that I have. Um, they do a real good job. Uh, And, and we do have puppies now and then, but uh, not not real often. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's amazing information. I 
I'm particularly fascinated by our conversation here because it's just so unique to a, a unique and different part of the world from where I live and the application of the dogs is so different. And um, so I really appreciated you joining us. Would you maybe, well, here, I have one more question for you. Satus Stock Dogs, S-A-T-U-S. What's the name Satus come from? Uh, Satus is the little valley that I live in here. Um, and then we have Satus Creek here and Satus Pass. Now, for all I know, Satus could be inviting people to rob me, but <laughs> it just seemed to make sense because that's, you know, that's where we live. Okay. All right. So you already had some geographical features out there named for Satus. It's just a unique yes. name. So I was curious. Okay. Uh, Randall Walker, thank you so much. Can you tell our audience how they can find you and reach out to you if they'd like to? Yeah, Aaron, uh, they, they can go to our Facebook page, which is say to stock dogs and livestock. We also have a, a website, say to stock Um, we're on YouTube and rumble under say to stock dogs. And we're also on TikTok, which was also say to stock dogs. <laughs> Perfect. And let me say, let me spell that one more time, just because it's not status and it's not status. It's S-A-T-U-S, Satus Stock Dogs. So, uh, Randall, thanks so much to, for your time today. It's been a fascinating conversation. I really appreciate it. You bet, Aaron. Thank you. Thanks.